car on a flat curve. Before we do the side view, let's go up in the air and look down on this car rounding a curve. So we're look, that's this picture here. Here's the vehicle, and it's moving in this direction, and it enters a curve like this. Now, if it goes around the whole circle, great, but if it just goes for a curve and then goes straight again, that's fine. This circular motion here, we can use our equations. So that's what it looks like from a top down. Now, what if you are standing over here, that's your top of your head, what does the car look like? Car is coming toward you and is going to your right, the car's left. How is it doing that? Well, the heat, the driver turns the wheels to the left. So you need a force to push him to the left. And what that is, that's the friction force between the ground and the tires. So the tires push down on the ground and the ground pushes back. And since you've turned the wheels, it'll push the driver to the left or, if you're watching it, to the right. So that's the force that's putting you in circular motion. The acceleration is in that direction towards the middle of this curve. You also have gravity pulling you down and then a normal force going in the up direction. So the ground's doing a couple things here. Ground pushes you straight up with a normal force and it also has a friction force that pushes you to make you go in a circle. Summarize everything we said on the previous slide because this is, this is pretty important to get. The free body diagram that we have now shows the car coming out of the page and rounding a curve to its left, your right. The normal force and mg are equal as we assume that the car is not bouncing up and down on the road. It has good shock absorbers. And finally, the force of friction provides a centripetal force that enables the car to round a flat curve, which is part of a circle. Let's set up our Newton's second law equations. First of all, in the y or vertical direction, the sum of the forces is zero, right? Because it's not bouncing up and down. What are the forces? Normal push points up, that's positive. Gravity's down, that's negative. Normal minus mg is equal to zero. Add mg to both sides and we get that equation. Now, why did we do that? Well, we're going to need the normal force for the friction force. Now let's look in our x direction. We have the sum of the forces is ma. The force we've identified as the force of friction is ma. And what is the force of friction? Well, that's mu, the coefficient of friction, times the normal force, which fortunately we found. And that equals m. And since we're going in a circle, we replace acceleration with v squared over r. OK, all that's left to do now is a little algebra and plug in the numbers. We have our x direction. We have mu times a normal force is mv squared over r. Right? That's the force of friction is mv squared over r. And then what is the normal force? Well, it's mg. So we plug that in and we have mu mg is mv squared over r. What's nice about that? The masses cancel. It doesn't matter what the mass of the car is, at least for this level of physics. So we have mu g is equal to v squared over r. And what are we trying to solve for? The coefficient of friction, which is mu, divide both sides by g. And here we go. Here's our final equation. We plug in the numbers, and we get a coefficient of friction of 0.23. Now, we can't say whether that's correct or not, but we can say it's plausible because it's less than 1. If we got an answer of like 20, that would be wrong, and we'd know we'd have to go back. And what else do we want to say about this? We've got the coefficient of friction. Yes, another advertisement for solving everything algebraically is once I have this formula, I can then say, well, what if I change the radius of the curve? Do I need a bigger coefficient of friction or less? What if I change the velocity? What's going to happen? Everything is in that equation.